So hello, everyone. Um, we can get started. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, so as you know, this is a Thermo Fisher-sponsored lunch symposium. It's titled, How NGS Solutions Are Advancing Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing. Um, I'm Alok Tomer. I'm Senior Manager, Product Management, and I manage the reproductive health portfolio at Thermo Fisher. Um, Thermo Fisher, as you guys know, um, it's a global company. Uh, we have over 100,000 employees worldwide. We are heavily invested in science and you know, growing this particular field. We have over 5,700 R&D scientists. We invested over $1.4 billion last year in, in research and innovation. Um, and revenue globally, Thermo Fisher has you know, over 40 billion in revenue uh, last year, right? So truly a global effort. Um, but I'm very pleased to introduce our expert panel here today. And we are extremely thankful uh, that they are participating here uh, on behalf of Thermo Fisher. Uh, I'll start with uh, Shanges uh, Jinoglu. Uh, he's a PhD, um, also a founder and CEO at NextGen Genetics. Then we have Amy Jordan. Um, she's director of reproductive ge uh, genetics. She's a licensed genetic counselor uh, working at NextGen Genetics. Um, we have Mira Shah, who is an MD. Uh, she's a reproductive end endocrinology and infertility specialist um, and is with Nova IVF. Um, so having said that, I'll pass it on to our expert panel. Again, we are extremely thankful for their participation, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy this talk. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to firstly thank uh, Thermo Fisher for their kind invitation to have me a speaker on this educational conference. Um, this is my disclosure. Um, I'm actually a CEO and co-founder of NextGen Genetic. So those are the learning objectives that I would like to discuss today. So we'll start with the fertilization check, and I would like to touch base with couple paper that was published a while ago. Oh, I need to be closer. Okay, sorry. Okay. So we'll kind of review a couple papers, uh, mainly about like um, fertilization check, how 0 pn and 1 pn or 2 pn are called. And then we will actually move to uh, improved PGTA, which this is going to be the main topic to talk about targeted single nucleotide polymorphism, next generation based technology. And uh, we'll again touch base about how we have those limitations with existing next generation sequencing platform and how we are going to be able to overcome with this uh, newer technology. Uh, towards at the end, we're going to also talk about a little bit uh, gamete source confirmation. Again, those are all SNP based NGS. And lastly, I want to, since we are in the same subject on single nucleotide polymorphism NGS, I would like to quickly go over single gene disorder and how we are actually. Uh, actually doing the testing uh, with the new, new te uh, testing methodology. So I put the slide uh, just to kind of to give a little bit an idea how we actually started. Um, many years ago, probably many of you doesn't even remember, we were doing actually five chromosome analysis with fish-based technology. We were able to screen only five chromosomes, uh, such as 13, 18, 21, X and Y. This is all macroscopic, very subjective technology. Um, after that technology, actually, we moved to molecular approach, such as array CGH, SNP array. Those are molecular approach. They both did really good uh, job, actually, with molecular approach to do improve, um, uh, to have a better accuracy with the uh, genetic testing. Uh, QPCR almost came at the same time. This is also molecular approach. I believe they all did good job for a while, but although they were like relatively newer technology, but most of them actually uh, pretty much disappeared and we moved to uh, next generation sequencing. So I call it NGS version one and part of the reason because NGS is really sounds good technology, but we had a lot of limitation with the molecular approach with array CGH, a single nucleotide polymorphism array. And in my opinion, NGS didn't bring a lot um, and we will talk about why. But before we talk about like um, the version one versus version two NGS platform, uh, I want to quickly talk about this uh, fertilization check. So probably I'm the last person to kind of to talk about fertilization check because I'm not an embryologist, but since I'm the speaker, probably I have to talk about this. So 
In every IVF clinic, um, fertilization check happens in the morning, and as you can see from those pictures, and uh, you can see actually through perinuclei, this is actually good development, and sometimes the embryo just see like no actually um, uh, perinuclei, which is those considered like abnormal, zero pn, and then when they see actually one perinuclei, this is also uh, considered abnormal uh, development, and in some cases we even see like three. So I won't use the same analogy. I did a lot of actually fish testing under the microscope, but when you have to do microscopic testing, there is definitely some limitations. Like for instance, when we were doing fish analysis, um, in order to, for us to make a call whether or not we have two copies from chromosome 21 or one copy, uh, we were always looking actually under the microscope, but in some cases, there are two signals who are overlapping on top of each other, and I have no way to look at what's underneath. So we were calling them monosomy, which in reality they were actually disomy. So this is the same analogy that I'm using right now, and um, those fertilization check um, actually uh, done well by the embryologist, but I think we are missing some of the calls which we can be addressed with improved PGTA technology, which is the ones that I will be discussing in the upcoming slide. So I was asking to myself, yes, we are currently using next generation sequencing, we were using array CGH, it's discontinued. We were using SNP array, it's almost about to discontinue. We moved to next generation sequencing. Is this new generation, next generation sequencing, is it bringing anything to the table? And the answer is in here. So we had a lot of limitation before, and those limitations are still exist. I mean, if you look at actually this table, so there is an NGS and there's a SNP NGS, which is the ones that I would like to focus today. So when you see actually this two, actually a comparison, we could do aneuploidy, we could do mosaic analysis, we could do actually polyploidy. But if you look at actually the rest of the table, for instance, haploidy, something is we cannot differentiate between diploidy, which is a big problem. Um, there is also a new terminology that we kind of like bringing to the field, sibling QC or cohort QC. When you have five embryos or six embryos, um, we can actually do the kind of like a QC uh, to see if they are all genetically related. Uh, monogenic disorder, this is another thing that we will be discussing in upcoming slide. Uh, this is also not actually possible with the regular NGS. Um, cumulus cell contamination, this is something that hopefully we can discuss today. We don't know actually how frequent they are, but based on our studies, what we have seen is cumulus cells in interfering with our overall results. And I think with this SNP markers, we will be able to overcome those issues um, with the newer technology. What about parentage confirmation? Uh, I know that things happen in the lab um, when you have an embryos and then you have some question. Um, we can actually do those parentage confirmation or uh, gamete confirmation by using those uh, polymorphic forms. So those are actually the things that we believe we can improve with the SNP based NGS, which will be an upcoming slide. So I put this slide because uh, when I was reading this, uh, this paper in 2017, and this become actually kind of my uh, research area because that paper, in my opinion, is a very nice paper. It's kind of clearly showed that when you do fertilization check under the microscope, you may miss a lot of them, and you can make all those uh, zero pn and one pn mistakenly. So if you look at overall the paper, um, there was a little bit over 5,000 metaphase two or so injected with the sperm. And what they found is, based on this um, analysis under the microscope, which is the fertilization check, they found 5.2% of those embryos were 1 pn. And they found 0.7% is 2.1 pn. I don't know what 2.1 means, probably they're small pronuclei, that's why they call it not three, they're not calling two, they're just like in between. Um, but I wanna focus with the 1 pn at this point. And because 0.7% becomes 2.1, but when they did actually further testing, because they know there is a limitation with existing NGS, they did further testing by using uh, informative markers such as STR or single nucleotide polymorphism, knowing that there is a limitation with existing uh, NGS. And what they found is 69.2% um, of the 1PN that were called 1PN, in reality, they were deployed. So it could have been discarded, it could have never been transferred. Same thing, um, and the ones that actually with the haploid, and the 23.3%, the ones that were called haploid, they were actually correct. And in fact, one of the sample even actually was tri uh, triploid, which was called 1PN uh, under the actually microscope when they did the fertilization check. So the whole point is in here, 
Um, I think we are doing a really good job by looking under the microscope to do the fertilization check and make the decision whether or not those are 0 PN, 1 PN. But looks like molecular approach is probably will give us the, the ultimate answer. So um, this is another, OK, I'll just kind of script this one. So just because of uh, this paper and a couple more other papers, we actually, um, a year ago, we decided actually to do a um, pilot study with FIV centers, where we actually tell the clinic, whenever they see 0 PN, 1 PN, uh, we actually ask them to still continue to actually develop them all the way to day five, day six. And we wanted to do the PGTA first, try to understand if it's euploid or aneuploid. And then we want to do actually uh, do additional testing, which is called short tandem repeat. And that's the reason I put the slide in here for the people who doesn't know about STR. Uh, those are widely used in many different fields. In my previous life, I was forensic scientist. I did a lot of parentage testing by using those uh, highly polymorphic STR markers. Um, those are actually, as you can see from the name, those are uh, small repeat. Uh, they are actually located in the intron, it's not an exon. And although we don't know exactly what did they mean, but we have been using them for parentage, human identification. Even in my laboratory, I use actually those STR markers to rule out or detect maternal cell contamination. And even embryonic level, we have been using them to detect those haploidy, which we will discuss in an upcoming slide, for single gene disorder as well, to do the linkage. And even we have an ongoing research for non-invasive PGT in order to detect or rule out maternal cell contamination, STR is always kind of very useful. So how the STR technology works, because again, this is part of our pilot study that I want to mention. So you have maternal DNA and you have uh, paternal DNA and you have embryonic DNA. So in order to do kind of like the parentage confirmation, uh, we have those actually STR kits that already commercially available. A lot of FDA labs, um, forensic labs, forensic application has been using those markers because they are very highly polymorphic. And there was a lot of population study was done. So I just put one, one screenshot in here that are actually uh, four STR markers. I'll kind of show you, this is one, one of them. So if you look at actually one specific STR markers, if the mother has a heterozygosity and the father has another heterozygosity, the child has to get one from each side. And that's kind of like how you do actually the parentage, uh, parentage testing. So the other circles, each one is actually representing one STR. So by doing all those testing, you can actually confirm or rule out or, um, uh, the parentage. So I put this actually table just to show you we have 24 markers. They are very powerful, again, markers, because again, population study has been completed with those. And before even we used for the study, we wanted to validate those STR markers. And, and we actually utilized uh, corial cell lines. Those are actually already known karyotype. And we had a family from cystic fibrosis family. We take mother and father, we profile them for every single STR markers, and we used actually those same markers for their child to understand actually how those matching help. So if we look at the specific example for that specific STR markers, the mother has 12 and 13 repeats, father has nine, nine homozygous repeats. And if you look at actually child, nine is coming from obviously from the father because father is homozygous, and then uh, the 12 is coming from the mother, and uh, that kind of show the matches. So again, if you take another example, uh, 16 and 20 is the repeats for the mother and cis heterozygote, and the father actually has a 15 and 16. So if you look at these two child next to each other, the first child get 15 and 20, which is, is get one repeat from each parents, and then uh, the second child happened to get 16 from each side. So again, if you look at all those markers, you can see the match. What about uh, mismatch? So we on purposely uh, mix two different families to understand how this technology works. And if you kind of put two different family in the same run, you will see a lot of actually discrepancy. Uh, the child will have some repeats that the parents doesn't have. So this is actually kind of like quick vis visualization uh, uh, for the testing. Now, how we used actually those to address this haploidy? Same idea. When we actually started this pilot study with FIV centers, so like, as I mentioned, we asked the clinic to put their comment whether or not they are 0PN or 1PN. 
and we requested parental samples at the beginning, so we profiled mom and dad with the same STR markers, and then we actually profiled the embryonic DNA, tried to understand if the embryo is getting both parental contribution or just one side. So again, this is one example. So the mother for this specific STR uh, markers is actually heterozygous, and it gives only one allele to the embryo, but nothing coming from the father. If you look at actually the second STR, the mother happened to be homozygous, and the father is actually heterozygous, but there is nothing is coming from paternal side. So if you look at all the markers, you see like one peak, one allele across the board. So this is very clear indication that this embryo is only get from maternal contribution and nothing for the paternal side. And again, if you continue with the other STR markers, you see again across the board, there is only one allele in the embryonic and everything is coming just only from one side. So this STR has actually helped us to identify those haploides and then diploides uh, with this marker. Um, so this is one example where we got a case. We received parental samples, and then in the same cohort, there were two embryos were indicated, uh, one PN. So we profiled the mom and dad, and then when we look at the uh, embryo, uh, that specific embryo, actually there is only one embryo in here, and what we found is embryo actually has heterozygosity across the board. So that means there is a parental contribution from both sides. So that embryo cannot be haploid, cannot be one, uh, one PN. And again, if you look at again all the STR markers, you will see the, the embryo has a heterozygosity and they're getting those contribution from both parental side. So this is another example that I was kind of mentioning. This is another case. The couple had multiple embryos. Two of them actually indicated 1PN by the embryologist. And when, when you look at actually the result, the embryo number one has a lot of heterozygosity, which they get one allele from, uh, uh, from the mother and their father. And actually that was called 1PN, but in reality it was 2PN. So we were able to rescue this embryo. But if you look at the second embryo, which is embryo number three, um, it was called 1PN, and the call was correct because we see only one allele across the board that's only coming from maternal side. So again, in this example, we were able to rescue one embryo, but other embryos was correct, so at least we confirm. So then we said, like, do we really need the parental samples to do the testing? So short answer is no, because without even parental samples, if you see a lot of heterozygosity, so you know that this is indication for diploidy, but if you get one allele across the board, that's the kind of indication for haploidy. So with the study, we stopped actually requesting parental samples and we were able to actually uh, look at those haploidy and, sorry, heterozygosity and homozygosity to make the calls whether or not they're euploid or diploid. But STR markers is definitely not very high throughput. It takes a lot of time and effort to do those. So we actually decided to collaborate with our actually co collaborator. Instead of actually using STR markers, we actually decided to kind of work, work with the SNP markers, single nucleotide polymorphism. It's pretty much the same idea. They are very highly polymorphic. Um, the reason actually we did not want to use actually STR markers for a lot of the reason, because there, are all, there aren't a lot of STR markers in the genome, but there are quite a lot of SNP markers in the whole genome. Just to give you kind of idea, there are probably 50,000 STR markers throughout the whole genome, but there are probably over 5 million SNP markers. So with our collaboration with Thermo Fisher, actually, we come up with a nice kind of like uh, high throughput model where you can actually put those SNP markers in the assay that you will be able to actually overcome all the limitation that we are facing, such as triploidy is another thing which I didn't talk about too much, uh, but we had the limitation with the 69XXX, it's been called normal, and with the regular NGS, so now we are able to actually call all those even uh, triploidies as well. And the other thing that I just was mentioning in my earlier talk about maternal cell contamination, uh, I don't think anyone really paying attention to those. I don't think this is happening a lot, but it is exist. Um, especially some of those sex discrepancies can be probably explained by those cumulus cells contamination, because contamination is not always 100%, it can be also partial. So with the SNP, SNP platform, we will be able to see those partial contamination if there is one, and we can actually normalize the data. And when I say normalize the data, I'll just give you an example. Um, recently, um, one of the recent cases that we did, we saw one of the chromosomes was looked like high mosaic, 
with that specific chromosome, which I forgot which chromosome was it. Um, the couple did not have any other option other than specific that high mosaic embryo, so they did the transfer. And unfortunately, they ended up with miscarriage. So we looked at the miscarriage and we found that aneuploidy was fully actually there in the POC. But when we went back and looked at that specific embryo, it turned out that there was like partial contamination. Since the mother doesn't carry those abnormalities, it kind of like showed this is a high mosaic chromosome, which in reality, it was full. So that will help actually also us about um, how can we actually normalize the data and give the most accurate results. Although we didn't aim it, but as a bonus, we get this actually cohort QC, meaning that when we get five or six embryos, by looking those SNP markers, we can actually say those actually uh, embryos are genetically related, which kind of would be a good QC for any uh, embryology lab. Although we haven't actually kind of like fully actually uh, committed to ourselves for this parentage testing, but uh, near future we will be able to also parentage testing or actually gamut source analysis. If the parental samples is provided, we can compare those SNP markers with the embryonic DNA that we can confirm those uh, gamut source. So basically, this is not my slide, but the summary of this, actually, the whole actually talk is basically, we are trying to rescue those zero PN and one PN and embryos. And in fact, we would like to make the life easier for embryology lab. Can you imagine if you don't have to really do fertilization check? Um, because the ultimate answer is gonna come from molecular approach. Because um, an upcoming, actually, talk by Amy and uh, Dr. Shah, um, they will have a kind of some really nice, uh, um, uh, outcome data from the clinics uh, and um, how we can rescue those embryos without actually even doing fertilization check because this newer technology will probably help us to get the ultimate answer rather than actually uh, doing those under the microscope. So since we are on this single nucleotide polymorphism NGS topic, I just want to quickly go over single gene disorder uh, because it's very relevant to our discussion. Historically, most of the single gene disorder has been done either by conventional STR testing, STR markers that I just was mentioning earlier for linkage. And there's another assay called um, single nucleate polymorphism array. And uh, there are a couple actually commercial platform to accommodate those single gene disorder. But the ones that I wanna talk about this uh, SNP based NGS, which is the one that we are currently utilizing. But before we jump into our platform, I just want to quickly go over how the linkage testing or the single gene disorder has been handled. Uh, I will, I'm going to start actually with the one that has been used, utilized for the longest. Uh, those are actually STR markers, like as I mentioned to you. STR has a lot of actually um, uh, place that has been used in multiple different fields. So if you look at in this example, this is just one part of the chromosome or one part of the genome, mom happened to have those five repeats. Those are actually ACC, ACC, those are in intron. And the second allele for the mom actually has a seven repeats. If you look at that for the same exact region, they have a different copies, actually different repeats, so which just happened to be six and seven. So if you look at an embryonic level, the only combination that you can get is that five, six, five, seven, or six, seven, or seven, seven. Those are actually the only combination. So if you want to really do the analysis on single gene disorder, you use those STR markers to understand which homolog chromosome is transmitted to the embryonic level. And based on those information, you would be able to tell whether or not the embryo is affected or unaffected or healthy. Again, if you kind of like uh, have the DNA, which is the DNA that we do the whole genome amplification from the biopsies, let's assume that we have this order, which is indicated in the red circle. So ideally, we would like to sequence that place to be able to kind of make the calls. But often, those part of the genome may not amplify um, just because we are dealing, de uh, dealing with the whole genome amplification. So when you can actually sequence this actually gap, you need to actually use some linkage markers to understand, again, which homologchromosome is transmitted from the parents uh, to the, their embryos. So when we have those actually um, a little drop up, then we use those stars, which is those stars actually is basically rep uh, representing one STR markers. And as I mentioned, there are not plenty STR markers that you can choose from. And when you are developing those probes, which probably many of you know, it takes time to develop those and you have to test and make sure that you are as close as possible to disease mutation to prevent any misdiagnosis 
due to crossover. So in many cases, even those STR markers may not even work because of the allele dropout, so you may end up with only like few markers. They are good protocol, good assay, is, it has been utilized, and I think it's been doing a great job, but I think we can improve our protocol by using SNP markers. And this is the, another technology um, based on SNP array, still single nucleotide polymorphism, it's unlike STR markers, they are utilizing single nucleotide polymorphism, and I just wanted to give you just one example. This is on array-based. Instead of you repeat, you have those single nucleotide changes. In this example, mom has GG allele and D, uh, dad has TT allele. If you put them in AA or BB context, again in embryonic analysis, you have either AA homozygous, BB heterozygous, or AB heterozygous. So same idea. We would like to get this disorder to, to be sequenced, but if that part of the genome doesn't amplify, so you actually have to do this linkage. One of the advantage with the SNP over STR, you have more markers to choose from because there are five million SNPs versus 50,000 STR to choose from. So again, keep in mind that anytime we develop those um, STR markers or SNP markers, we try to be as close as possible to make sure that there is no misdiagnosis happens due to uh, crossover events. The good thing about with this platform is you have more markers to work with compared to only a few markers with the STR. But one of the big limitations is you are limited to whatever you have in the array. And you cannot customize the array for each case. It takes forever to, to kind of like validate and, and uh, chip array. So again, if there are some disease that you don't have enough coverage, then you cannot still use this platform. You may actually have to do combination of both STR, direct mutation, and uh, actually those SNP markers. So again, compared to six markers, probably have better markers coverage, which is 30, which is better than six, obviously. But today I wanna talk about the uh, targeted, actually, SNP markers and that you can customize. Again, the idea is the same. So mom has GG and the dad has TT. If you put those AB context, you are gonna look at those heterozygosity and homozygosity. One of the big advantage with the targeted SNP approach, you are not actually limited to anything. You can actually customize whichever disease you want. It doesn't matter whichever the chromosome are located. So you can target those SNP markers. And uh, the, the, the good thing is about this, we are actually kind of targeting close to 200 markers compared to uh, 30 markers with SNP array or actually six kind of markers with STR. So that kind of brings actually more uh, uh, accuracy and more confidence to us when we make those calls uh, with next generation sequencing with the single neglected polymorphism based approach. Um, so we are able to actually do simultaneous analysis, PGTA and single gene disorder, but in some cases, the couple are already in the middle of the cycle, they realizing that they have some condition, so we can still actually go back and actually look at the samples, purify the samples, and we can still do targeted uh, sequencing to actually address those uh, disease and conditions. This is a kind of an example, uh, the technology that we are utilizing. Uh, this is one example, the case happened to be Lynch syndrome, autosomal dominant, and uh, based on uh, the family history, what we know that um, the male is the carrier and he received actually this condition from her mom. Everything is color coded in here, so as you can see, uh, the female is completely gray because she's not carrying anything for that specific condition. And the male actually has two alleles. The ones with the red, or actually the ones with the uh, yellow, is the ones that are uh, carrying the disease. And the blue is the ones that actually, the, the allele that doesn't carry. If you look at, again, mom, and you can see actually this orange is actually transmitted to uh, her son. And now we have six embryos. So when you look at those actually, this is just a small sh screenshot. Obviously we have like more SNP markers to look at. And if you look at again that specific first embryo, you would see this allele, unaffected allele coming from the mother, and unaffected allele come from the father. So this is healthy embryo, and the second and the third one is also healthy. But if you look at the last three, you will see this uh, oranges is coming from the paternal side, or the yellow one is coming from paternal side and those are all affected embryos. So based on kind of like doing those uh, informative markers, you would be able to do those linkage markers and make the calls. Again, one of the advantage of using this technology is we are using quite a lot of markers that kind of bring us high confidence to us. 
And the other uh, good thing about this technology, just because of we are using quite a lot of informative markers, there are some diseases that we see quite often. So those actually uh, markers has been already developed and ready to go. That kind of to shorten the time for probe development that the couple can start the cycle uh, as soon as possible.